For Denai Thomas, it has been a challenging year. Sorry. In the first TV interview of these old friends, the wounds of their ordeal still feels brand new. Yeah, you're going back through the trauma, do you know I mean? It's hard. Yeah. Last September, Denai, Davina and Selma's night of fun at the bingo ended in despair and dispute with a white female passenger on their train home. The incident happened on the northern line at King's Cross, where it escalated. Before we know it, we were subjected to a very vile, racist, uh, verbal abuse, which consisted of racial profanities, uh, monkey chants being made at us, and subjected to being called slaves. There was then a physical altercation. Selma's arm was bitten. In the melee that erupted, hair was grabbed. I heard her scream, she's biting me. And I couldn't even see her. There were so many people on the train and I couldn't see her. And I could just hear her screaming in pain. It was awful. It then emerged an off-duty officer had been present the entire time. But the women say only intervened once things got physical. When a British transport police arrived, their abuser cried and appeared to win the sympathy of officers. In a heated exchange with police, Danae Thomas told a male officer that when white women are racist, they play the victim. And as the officer was white, she did not trust his intervention. The policeman suggested her remarks were racist against him. Danae was later charged for racially aggravated harassment against the officer, whilst her abuser was given a caution. My attacker is now acting like the, the victim, <laughs> you know what I mean? and crying and I'm trying to explain that your privilege has no status here you you're the attacker here and that to, and I'm explaining that to a member of the police and then that gets turned round on me to attack me even further mm. that's deep we were shouting but we were shouting because we was not heard then they pinpointed it all on us. The narrative changed. No, you guys are the ones that have, you know, attacked this lady. All three women were later charged for assault. But on the day of court, the CPS dropped the charges and admitted they were unlikely to be convicted on the back of new evidence. The women are now demanding an apology for wrongful prosecution and are poised to take legal action. The British Transport Police say an investigation into the incident took place to establish the full circumstances. The Crown Prosecution Service found their evidence met the threshold to authorise charges, but two of the women who were offered cautions declined and were therefore charged. They say we are satisfied detectives carried out a thorough investigation into allegations from both parties. But at a time of tension, these women believe the authorities are misusing legislation meant to protect minorities to prosecute them. I don't have any confidence that the CPS is able to differentiate between those that are rightfully trying to challenge and stand up for themselves, but more importantly, to also protect themselves. We've not received any justice for what's happened to us. Our white attacker merely received a caution uh, which has closed off all avenues for us in terms of seeking justice from her. So we want to understand why. Selma's case is part of a wider history. As leader of the Southall Black Sisters, she advocates for black and Asian women. The organisation was founded amidst the fight against the National Front. And as the dark days of far-right violence return, they say the law is over-policing racial minorities as suspects you're under-policing them as victims. Well, that was Simeon Brown. Joining me now is Andrew George, president of the National Black Police Association. Um, thanks for joining us. You know, we, that was an individual story of one case, and we've told stories like that for as long as Channel 4 News has been on the air. I mean, do, do you think, um, you know, sometimes people of ethnic minorities get treated differently from people in the white community? by the police. Yeah. You know, definitely, you know, our experiences, the data backs up what we would say as well, that people from minority ethnic backgrounds end up being treated slightly differently to others, um, the majority communities. We end up 
more disproportionately targeted by stop and search, use of force, deaths in custody. Um, but even in the internal environment, police officers are more likely to face misconduct. You're less likely to get recruited into policing and less likely to get promoted. So all in all, generally, um, it's people from ethnic minority backgrounds that definitely are on the, the wrong side of police use of powers. Um, now, this week, we saw, you know, we've seen these, this new accusation levelled at the police by the right, um, that they are more lenient towards ethnic minority uh, groups uh, than they are towards white people. And that has been angrily denied by the police. But the trouble is, you know, the police have also denied that they are institutionally racist. So, so where, where does that leave you when you're trying to work out what the truth is? No, completely. And, and this, this, you know, debate, this uh, failure to admit that institutional racism is, pr is still present within the police service has, you know, allowed misinformation to come forward. We're an evidence-based organisation. All we need to do is look at the stats, look at the data, and that will ensure that we understand what the, what the um, issues actually are. You know, chief officers generally come from white backgrounds. They have certain perceptions, certain um, perspectives that don't really... Um, take in the views of those from minority ethnic backgrounds. So, you know, we would always say just, just you know, admit what the experiences of um, people from minority ethnic backgrounds have been so that we can finally move forward. The evidence doesn't show that there's a two-tier system. I was reviewing some of, the ev uh, some of the data from back in the 2011 riots, and I think there was over 3,000 arrests in the first few days of those riots. So you know, it's only been just over 500 now in, in the disorder that we've seen recently. So you know, everybody needs to make sure that the information that they are getting is factual, that it's been checked, and that um, it can be verified. I think you're just le losing your earpiece. You might want to sort of pop it back in um, so you can hear me. Uh, more clearly. I mean, so, so I mean, you know, yes, the facts are there, and uh, if you if you go looking for them, but there's a danger that this new alle allegation from the right sort of gains traction, isn't there? And that people start to think that that's a real thing. What what do you think should be done to tackle that misinformation? Yeah, no, the misinformation. You know, I heard um, others on speaking about it just before I come on. That misinformation needs to be tackled. You know, we have been here before, you know, whenever newspapers were brought out, whenever the radio and media were brought forward. Information that's alive on the online social media space needs to be tackled. It needs to be regulated in the same way that other news organisations and, and where people get their information from. You know, we, we've heard people chat about the digital town square. You are not allowed to do certain things that happen on the online space, in the physical space, in the actual town square. So we just need to make sure that all of the legislation, all of our um, policing um, tactics are equipped, um, are future focused and look at all of these in, um, inputs in, and developments in technology. Now there have been some senior police leaders um, from the National Association who have conceded that institutional racism is a problem. The most senior police officer, Sir Mark Rowley, from the Met, hasn't. Do you think it would actually still make a difference if he did say, yes, it's been a problem or is a problem now? No, completely. I've spoken to Sir Mark on a number of occasions. I've said that that admission of institutional racism would be well received. That has been borne out in Sarah Crewe's brave admission in Avon and Somerset. What that does is, is legitimise um, the experiences of those from ethnic minority backgrounds. It shows that the Commissioner um, takes their view seriously, looks at the data and wants to move forward. So for me, that admission is crucial to making sure that ethnic minority communities understand and believe in, in the, uh, the rhetoric coming from police leaders, that they want to reform and they want to move forward. Andrew George, thank you very much.